We have apologies from Grace. Um, uh, so we have two apologies. Apologies from Grace and apologies from Howard. Um, Howard is unwell at the moment and our thoughts are with um, Howard and his family at this time. Uh, but Jonathan, thank you very much for standing in. It's nice to see you again and uh, no doubt you'll do a sterling piece of work uh, in the meantime. Um, are there any new declarations of interest? Chair, I've got a couple to declare. Can you hear me? Richard, thank yeah. you. Uh, so since leaving the King's Fund, I've taken on a couple of part-time positions as a Senior Policy Advisor at the Health Foundation and Senior Advisor at Newton Europe Limited, which is a health and social care consultancy. Okay, thank you, Richard. And Frank, your hand went up as well. Yeah. Um, it's difficult to see declaration of interest, but Erica and I were anxious that you should be aware. We're both members of the John Curl High School Academy, Ross. I don't think it's a problem at all, but Erica might want to add something. I don't know. Erica, anything you want to add? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. It was just, uh, I think, just making you aware um, of what we're up to. OK, thank you very much, Erica. Um, I've got a little bit of a technical problem at the moment. Hopefully you can all still hear me. Um, so the last set of minutes of the 4th of March, was everyone happy with the accuracy of those minutes? Please raise a digital hand if you weren't. Frank, your hand is up. Yeah, I just got one thing to clarify, Russell. I, I suggested at the... Um, reasons for leaving section that we should look at trends of the things we can control not waste time looking at all the trends um and those words looking at things we can control are not in the minutes and it's just i think it'd be helpful for the future if we clarify that okay thank you very much um any other amendments to the minutes Okie dokie. So we therefore move on to the action points to rising, which are on page 13. Um, and the first two, which were on the quality report and workforce, are both, um, the first is on the agenda and the second is within the report. So thank you for that, Lucy and Geoffrey. And then the work on the ED transformation business case, um, that will be uh, forwarded in due course, Anne. And any idea when that's likely to be? It's already complete, Chair. Uh, it was set around last week. Um, and um, anybody who wants to uh, watch a, a, a video regarding um, the, the ED transformation work and the opening of SDEC and the service that we're providing there uh, can go on to YouTube and look under the Y Valley account. And there's a, there's a video there with some interviews of the staff as well. That's great. Thank you very much, Alan. Any other matters arising that I may have missed? OK, moving on then to Glenn's report. Glenn, the Chief Executive's report. Please. Thank you, Russell. So the um, I'll, I'll just take you through some highlights from the report. So firstly, if it's a highlight, the NHS budget discussions um, concluded oddly this year with, with a, a settlement for the first half of the year, so H1, um, with discussions due to continue in the summer over the second half of the year. I mean, partly that's down to the uncertainty around the ongoing costs associated with COVID but also it links to the other element that I've identified there, which is the um, elective incentive scheme uh, and obviously the need for the NHS to recover elective activity to deal with uh, with what uh, will be a, a challenging waiting times uh, scenario. Um, and that kind of links in a little bit to the planning guidance. So that was published uh, at the end of last week. Normally that's published before Christmas um, and we then have time to prepare, but um, it came out last week. There were no great surprises in there because obviously a lot of it focuses on the ongoing COVID situation, the elective recovery I've described, but also the implementation of integrated care systems, which we we spent some time discussing in terms of the local implications of that this morning at, at workshop. I suppose what's notable is there is no new uh, backstop waiting times target for the NHS quoted at the moment. My understanding is one will is likely to be set once we get into the second half of the year, but there's a degree of uncertainty around the the exact waiting list position at the moment and how it may change over the coming months. So there's uncertainty about how 
uh, referrals may uh, may change, whether we, we, we see uh, an increase in referrals from those patients who have not come forward over the last year. Uh, and there's certainly uncertainty around the capacity that's available with the impact of infection prevention and control. And that's why the incentive scheme has been set up to try and encourage all trusts to contribute. Now, it's a scheme that, that sits at, at, at ICS level. So for us, that's a scheme that, that will also therefore be dependent on the performance of our colleagues in Worcester. So we'll be working carefully with them to ensure that we can deliver, I mean, firstly, deliver the activity to ensure that we treat our patients, but also to try and ensure that we, we, we seek a, a appropriate funding for the costs associated with that. I'll just pull out the the um, the, th the four headlines there from from the um, the guidance, the planning guidance. So improving outcomes in population health and healthcare, tackling inequalities and in outcomes, experience and access, enhancing productivity and value for money, and then uh, the new one that came in at the end there, which is helping the NHS to support broader social and economic development. So that's very much uh, playing to our role as an anchor institution. Um, uh, unfortunately, also, all of these objectives tie in to the objectives that we agreed locally. So we looked at them last month in board, including the, the addition of that anchor institution element. Big focus on staff well-being, which we've uh, discussed a number of times at board and we'll discuss throughout the year. Uh, and then the uh, formal announcement of the new suite of urgent care measures, which uh, we'll be tracking. And, and I highlight the three big ones there that we will no doubt be looking at our performance against over the coming months. We've also had system level capital allocations. Those are going to be quite tight. Um, they give a, a capital ceiling to uh, Hereford and Worcester and uh, discussions are underway in terms of how we uh, we, we uh, what our our share of that is and, and we'll bring those back to the board. I then reference same day emergency care. There's a video available, um, as Alan said, and it's great to see that facility available. I mean, the way we manage urgent care uh, over the coming year will be one of the key things to how we deliver the elective recovery, because if we can contain our urgent care within its footprint uh, and ensure no cancellations, that will give us quite a step up in, in capacity. Um, I then referenced the Foundation Group 3 boards meeting, which I always enjoy, and it was great to see a best practice example of our integrated community teams in Y Valley, plus uh, examples from the other two. We also then discussed the staff survey in the three boards meeting, and I won't um, I won't go through that because Jeff is going to take us through that later, but really good performance uh, from, uh, from the trust, uh, and, and that's the most important measure for me each year. Um, one more thing I just wanted to pull out finally on, on the um, more from our great team section, integrated care division, a really good example around wound care here of something that uh, improves the quality of service to patients, but also uh, delivers efficiency uh, and, and cost reduction. So getting this right first time uh, obviously makes it great for patients, but, but reduces the ongoing cost of the system. And those are the kind of things that we will be looking at all the more as we move forward as lead provider uh, in our uh, in our local place of Herefordshire. And then we list those going the extra mile awards that we've uh, just given out at the start of the meeting. I'm happy to take questions, Chairman. Thank you very much, Glenn. Clearly an awful lot going on at the national and um, uh, county-wide level. Um, questions or perspectives, Andrew? Uh, yeah, maybe I should have picked this up earlier, but it's the elective incentive scheme at um, system level, does that mean there will be some um, emphasis on equalising lists across? I know your, your paper picks up the, the need to re reward activity, but there could be some differentials which become apparent in that process, couldn't there? Yeah, I, mean, I, I wouldn't have done it this way if I'd chosen to do it nationally. I, I mean, I think I think we should be equalising waiting times. That's one of the ways that we can deal with the inequalities issue. But I, and I'd have made the waiting times challenge a system wide challenge, but then I'd have uh, incentivised individual providers to to deliver activity. But yes, there's a the the expectation within this nationally is that we'll use the capacity that we have to tackle the longest waiters regardless of where they sit in the system. That's easier in some parts of the country and it's you know it's easier in, for example, London where they'll be able to move elective activity between sites. For us, there's big distances between sites and patients don't always choose to move. But yes, it's a, it's a system level uh, access target and a system level productivity target. 
Thank you, Andrew. And Chris? Thank you. I was interested in the Wound Care Strategy Programme and I wondered as part of this, what plans had been made to work with the voluntary sector in setting up leg club clubs in the community? Obviously, at the moment, that wouldn't be possible because of COVID, but there's huge benefits there where you can use making every contact count for district nurses to pick up issues as people come in, as a social setting, uh, you know, in, the, in a sort of community hub. And I, I would just commend that model uh, to, to colleagues if, if, if appropriate. Yeah, I completely agree. I think increasingly we'll, we will be trying to integrate care in, in our system, but it will it will be the best people delivering it, including the voluntary sector and, and, and using them to help us to, to make interventions around health improvement. So, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, having having delivered such an excellent service, let, let's see if we can take it to another level. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And Richard? Yeah, just, just a quick uh, question for, for, for Glenn and possibly Jane and colleagues. But um, the, the planning guidance, I think, makes it clear that we've got a hell of a mountain to climb the next the next few months, with all the things that we're expected to do. And I wonder, as, the, as restrictions in wider society lift, whether public expectations of what we can provide will grow faster than our capacity to meet them. Yeah, I, I, I think obviously we still um, we've had a lot of support from uh, our communities as we've managed um, the coronavirus pandemic, um, and you know we hope that that support uh, and encouragement will continue. But there, there are people that will be, as a consequence, waiting a long time on their waiting lists, and um, and certainly the media will will be um, will, will will forget. <laughs> what we've gone through quite soon so we are we are getting ourselves ready for how we manage this i was talking to someone yesterday actually about how we manage elective waiting times so you imagine if you're in a in a in an airport and your flight's delayed one of the most um important things there is communication so uh, not knowing what's going on at that point is really key so the way we communicate with our patients about where they are on the waiting list what the expectations are and hopefully that will that will deal with some of that concern and worry and potentially avoid us having to to, to make lots of uh, explanations and answer lots of questions from patients. But um, yeah, it, it, I, we, we've got a huge challenge here and, and the support we can get from our public to understand where we are and the pace through which we're able to recover, bearing in mind the, the, the workload and the impact of the pandemic on our workforce. Um, we very much appreciate their, their forbearance as we go through that. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Richard. Can I ask everyone to start mute unless you're talking? And um, Jane, was there anything you wanted to add to Richard's question? Yeah, I think the other thing that will help us in that is how we uh, how we work with primary care. So the work that uh, particularly um, uh, uh, David's leading on sort of that joint approach to how we manage waiting lists is is really important because I think uh, GPs are in a good place to have that direct relationship with the public and explain. Um, and, uh, and and help us navigate our way through this. Thank you, Jane. Any other questions or shall we move on to the integrated performance dashboard? OK, so Jane, do you want to introduce the IPD for us, please? I will do so uh, just a, a few points as uh, as always. Um, uh, so as today, we've got uh, no patients with COVID who are inpatient uh, in the in the hospital. Our last admission for a patient with a COVID diagnosis was the 25th of uh, March. So all of that is positive and really encouraging. But obviously the easing of lockdown started um, earlier this week. And so we've got a watching brief on that. But But I think everybody feels pretty optimistic that our most uh, vulnerable um, parts of our population should be protected from hospitalisation um, uh, by vaccination. So, um, you yeah, know, we will see what happens over the next uh, over the next few weeks. Um, uh, staff engagement and, and clinical leadership has been um, absolutely at the heart of, well, our, 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 I mean, our strategy about how we want to run the organisation, but has been absolutely at the heart of our response. Um, and obviously we're going to continue that um, uh, approach as we turn our attention to restoration and, uh, uh, and recovery. And uh, we've established, um, it was John's idea and, um, and John's leading it, uh, our sort of pause and reset meetings with all of our specialties and services. And the first three of those have run uh, this week and, and have been a, a positive experience. We've heard, I think, some things we expected and some things that we, that we, that we didn't expect. But the purpose of those meetings 
is to understand the impact that um, this last 12 months has had um, on staff and what they've been through. And so where necessary, we can provide additional um, uh, support, but also that we can um, understand um, uh, their perspectives on how they restore their services. And, uh, and particularly some of those pathway changes. And we've got some really good examples, which I put in the, in the narratives, narrative around sort of dermatology and endoscopy. Yeah, you know, some really positive um, uh, changes that should mean we'll have lower referrals uh, going to the future and we'll provide patients with, uh, with, with better care that's, that, that's closer to their home. Um, but for other specialties, as Glenn alludes to, um, you know, we, we may see a really big rebound in referrals as uh, as primary care particularly sort of opens uh, back up again and, 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 and patients or people's expectations of uh, care, you know, quite rightly, they, they, they want to receive a service. So um, uh, Johnny's going to talk um, uh, a bit more detail in private board around the risk management aspect of that and how we're going to take that uh, take that forward. Um, and so I guess my last point really was, um, you know, all of that staff engagement. Um, uh, I, I, again, I won't steal Jeffrey's uh, thunder, but the, yeah, the national staff survey results are really encouraging. And of course, they tell us things uh, and more things that we need to do and we need to focus on. But it, but it's really encouraging to see that year on year improvement. And, uh, and we will be uh, taking that forward. Thank you very much, Jane. Any questions to Jane before we go into the detail? Andrew? Yeah, if it's okay to take a finance question now, because um, your, your concluding sentence and the inability of us to deliver COVID plans, which is really associated with the third wave, yeah. um, it, was nothing, it was nothing to do with our ability. Um, it was, uh, but, um, and that creates a three million pound surplus, and we touched on this last time, but because of that explicit link, which I think is helpful, um, is there a way of formally bringing that money into this year because it was does that make sense it was given to us yep. for a reason and we not through no fault of our own um yeah i think they want to talk to this one <laughs> yeah i, I realize this is a a problem we've not had before as an organization um but i mean we we will will make appropriate provisions in our uh, annual uh, accounts in, in order to ensure that the appropriate things are charged to old year versus new year. But um, it, the way that this has to work across the NHS is that the you know the, the, those all our positions add together to deliver a position for the the whole NHS. So we 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 can't easily move that money from one year to the next, other than making the provisions that I described. Jonathan may want to add to that, but but that that's the reality. Anything you want to add, Jonathan? Uh, yes, just very briefly. I mean, quite agree with that. Um, we've obviously got new auditors and we're having to be quite conscious around how we account. Um, the one thing I would add to that, though, is it has given us an opportunity and for things like annual leave, where in previous years we've been almost forced to take a particular approach on that, it is actually giving us an opportunity to accrue for that. Um, fully and appropriately and is putting us in a better position in future years from our financial accounting perspective. Um, so it, it won't be break even, but I think we are trying to do what we can to actually get the cumulative position correct. And also, of course, any surplus will actually reduce our historic deficit on the balance sheet as well. Thank you, Jonathan. Colleagues have to move on to the detail with um, Lucy, first of all. Thank you, Jane. Lucy, over to you. Thank you, Russell, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to take the report as read, but just focus on three things very briefly, if I may. So one being the Health Watch um, input that um, Health Watch has been doing with our patients, a little bit on staffing and a little bit on the draft quality priorities, if I may. So boards will know that we've been since last October surveying a sample of uh, patients discharged from our care so 50 patients are randomly selected each month and sent a survey uh, to look at their experiences of, of their care with us but in particular their discharge uh, and our communication support around discharge and aftercare um, and we've been working really closely with Health Watch um, 
um, who have been following up any of those patients who have been surveyed, have been given the opportunity to have a telephone conversation with Health Watch to talk in more detail about their experiences. And in the report, I allude to the fact that Health Watch were due to present their uh, report to their board uh, this week and they also presented it to our patient experience committee on Tuesday of this week and they surveyed over 60 of our patients and I will circulate after board a copy of the report. I think there's a lot in there that we should be proud of, uh, a lot of things, uh, there's some overwhelmingly positive comments in there, uh, particularly in relation to um, patients experience of being cared for during the pandemic uh, and a particular thanks to nursing staff actually. Um, as always there's, there's things that we need to get better and uh, the report makes uh, eight recommendations uh, for things to improve but under four sort of general themes which is communication, medication, aftercare and the discharge lounge. And some of the recommendations are really easy to fix. So, for example, the discharge lounge, um, they don't like the, the environment and it's a little bit cold. The, the, they are things we can fix really easily. Uh, there's a suggestion around aftercare, around is there anything we can do with follow up conversations with our patients um, just to check in on them, really. And we already have a plan to use volunteers to do that. So many of the recommendations are already in train and our proposal is that we bring the health watch report back to quality committee later this month with them um, with the, those things that we're going to do to address those recommendations and we're continuing to work with health watch on an ongoing basis so that they continue to survey our patients um, where patients wish to speak to them in relation to staffing just very briefly to say that the staffing position is improving significantly as the incidence of covid in the community uh, is reducing and certainly the number of staff off sick because of COVID, we're down to single figures this week. And so the consequence of that is that um, um, the management of staffing for our wards is much easier. Um, all those staff that were redeployed to the intensive care unit have been deployed back to their substantive positions and uh, our reliance on agency is, has reduced in month, which is a good thing. And then finally, I've shared with you at the, uh, at the end of the report, the draft quality priorities. Um, they're aligned to the trust objectives that were previously approved at board um, last month or the month before. And they've also been developed in line with the guidance that's published around the development of quality accounts. Um, and those priorities have been selected to focus on those things that we either know we need to improve upon or that have happened as a consequence of the pandemic. They were discussed, discussed at Quality Committee on Monday of this week uh, with some recommendations just around um, perhaps the safety um, uh, quality priority to focus more on the impact of learning when we get things wrong um, and that we need to have a community focus in there. So there will be some adjustment to the quality priorities and they'll go back to Quality Committee at the end of this month for, for final approvement, uh, approval. Sorry. Uh, that's it for me and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Lucy. Very comprehensive. Uh, questions and perspectives, Glenn? Just to pick up the agency um, issue, there was a report, as you know, Lucy, in the, in the Sunday Times recently on this. Uh, and obviously the rates of pay that, that you pay to particularly the Thornbury agency is significantly higher than, than, than what we would pay to our own staff. And indeed, actually, those nurses don't get much of that money either. Um, so are we in a position looking at the trends obviously we've gone through a difficult period are we able to uh, invoke a ban on the use of thornbury at this point do you feel we should certainly look to eliminate the use of thornbury um i wouldn't like to sign up to a ban because there will be times when there's a safety issue particularly in a specialist area like itu that you may well need to go out to Thornbury if there is no other alternative. But now is absolutely the time, Glenn, you're, you're absolutely right that this provides us with an opportunity to um, to only use them where, where there's a, a significant safety issue. Or, or any other high cost agency for that matter. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Glenn. And any other questions or perspectives for Lucy? OK, thank you, Lucy, and uh, we congratulated your senior nursing team as the Going the Extra Mile team um, a few minutes ago, but uh, 
at the end of the day, you're the leader as well. So thank you for your uh, phenomenal hard work and leadership. Um, we'll move on then to the activity um, side of our equation. Um, Mr. Barnes. Thank you, Chair. I'll take the report as read and just try and pick out some highlights. Um, so in terms of demand, urgent care numbers are slowly going up, but they remain very volatile with some days very calm and some days exceptionally busy. Last weekend was particularly busy. Um, cancer referrals are back to normal, but there are a few exceptions in terms of um, uh, specialties, but we think we understand that mostly. Uh, and planned care, as we've heard, are um, both urgent and routine referrals are still down. They're, it's it's not just a, a legacy from the previous 12 months. They're, they're down each month on, on, the, on the corresponding month last year, obviously. We'll have to find a new measure because last year now will no longer make much sense because it was a, in the middle of the first lockdown. So we'll start to use probably the previous year for context. In terms of activity, cancer services are fully restored, still using the, the Nuffield a little bit, for, but more, more for... Uh, planned procedures from April from today onwards uh, rather than uh, cancer surgery. Plan, plan care is returning. We've got most of our theatres going as you later. A bit more detail later on, but they will remain below COVID numbers for now until we can find ways to increase productivity. And diagnostics um, <clears throat> doing very well. CT is exceeding its normal levels. MRI is improving quite rapidly. Ultrasound is a little bit of a concern with staff, sh staff having shielded, but is starting to return to more normal levels and they have managed to hold their position largely so that's quite good um performance um ed actually march's position as of yesterday has actually the best we've achieved since august at about 80 percent estec is now improving um it's well in february improved the volume of patients treated on the same day um and obviously the new unit open uh, um the last week or so then then we'll expect that to go further still um, cancer, two weeks weights, the performance remains really strong, performance remains really strong. City due day has gone down, but that's expected and predicted as a result of delaying diagnostics a few months ago as patients have come through. So that will probably take a month or two to work through before we see that improve again. RTC performance continues to fall and will fall again for uh, March. Um, we are now with planning guidance available, we are working on our baseline plan to see what else we can. We'll be taking some uh, proposals through to executive colleagues uh, next week to, to, to work out um, what our plan should be in the, in the light of that planning guidance. Um, sorry, um, yeah, diagnostics, I'll, I'll detail that later on um, a little bit more about some of the resources, but we have a new third CT coming online, so additional MRI capacity, and I say ultrasound returning, and a new DEXA scan. DEXA scan. We've already heard about the hard work in, in stroke services, so just to sort of um, finish on a bit of a high. We, we are still on a, on a SNAP C rating, which is below, we managed for four or five course on the track of B before we had to a C through the, through the, the pandemic, but the, the scores are improving. And TIA in particular is very, very strong, at sort of I think it's nearly 80% due to some really innovative approach to it from the stroke team, the consultants and the, and the nursing staff, some of which you heard about earlier. And that's really good. That's been a difficult thing for us to, to manage for years. In all my time here, I don't think we've achieved that consistently. So that's that's good news. I hope that continues. And and again, I think we've heard about it before, but it's worth mentioning the um, the best practice, excuse me, because the best practice tariff and necrophema. Necrophema is again, um, it continues to be quite strong. So a positive. And obviously we've got some really exciting developments in the next few months with the new wards opening and the orthogeriatric service coming online. So that should get stronger still. So I thought I'd finish on a few positives there. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And lots of, uh, because uh, some of the non-execs join your Tuesday morning calls, um, operational calls, lots of energy and innovation throughout the organisation. Really great stuff. Questions and perspectives to John? I think the other thing, John, that you didn't mention is some great work which David Mowbray is leading across the foundation group on um, productivity to try and identify ways that we can become more productive to more effectively uh, drive into the waiting times. Um, Frank? Yeah, I've been wondering how to find the opportunity to say this, Russell, just touching on what you just said. I, I look at these Tuesday morning things and I've been amazed, quite frankly, 
uh, the energy and the team spirit that John and his team have, have brought forward. It's quite remarkable, and I congratulate him. Yeah. I think it's something to do with the new beard, uh, Frank, but um, no, John, you're doing a great job. Um, OK, colleagues, happy to move on to Geoffrey. Geoffrey, over to you. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Russell. Well, we've just had some really positive news about the reduction of uh, COVID cases within the hospital. And we are seeing that as well reflected in the amount of sickness absence. So if you look at the report, you can see a significant reduction in, in sickness absence, which is good news for, for Wyoming Valley. However, mental health still remains a, a concern, and not just for Wyoming Valley, but uh, across the, the health service. So within Wyoming Valley, we will be equipping our line managers with uh, mental health awareness training. So working with mental health uh, England, we will be offering awareness training for all our managers over the, the uh, next few months. In addition to that, we are also working with occupational health in terms of trying to expand the counselling that we, we offer and also the clinical psychology interventions we, we have for staff. So keeping the, the focus on mental health, which we know is a key concern for our employees. In terms of performance appraisals, I mean, obviously, because of the COVID pressures, we haven't been able to move on with this. However, over the next four months, we're keeping a close eye on this, and we expect that the uh, the percentage will uh, will go up. And um, at the monthly F and P meetings, monthly leaders briefings, we are encouraging managers to complete the outstanding appraisals over the next few months. Um, the other key highlights are captured within my report, and we are certainly making good progress on the other key metrics. And certainly the most recent people poll survey that we received just goes to show how positive the employee experience still is within Y Valley, and health and well-being continues to be at the center of, of everything we do. So those are the key highlights of my report. Happy to take any questions. Can you hear us, Russell? You're muted. Technical problem, bear with. Uh, we can't hear you, Russell. Shall I fill in with the question I was going to ask then? Um, so it was just just an observation actually from this morning. Obviously, this morning we looked at, at the the work of the the, the new education directorate, uh, which was fantastic. But but also the impact that that they've had and some of the innovation they put in place around education fellows and the fact that that's reduced our uh, our spend on on uh, locum staff, but also improved the quality of care to patients. So it's just great to see the education um, directorate coming out of the ground with lots of ideas. So it's probably just something you can perhaps give us an update on as we progress during during the year, Geoffrey, on, on that. Yeah, I certainly will. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn, and uh, apologies for the technical issues. Uh, Frank, is that a legacy hand from you? No, if I may, please. Geoffrey, the Daily Bulletin reveals what appears to be quite some tension about the 500 quid bonus issue. But of course, we've no idea how big an issue that is. What, what's your your sense about whether it's a significant issue or not in undermining staff confidence? Um, we've had a few people who've raised that with us, but certainly um, we all understand and our trade union colleagues do understand that this is a national thing, so it's out of our hands. So we, what we've said is, I mean, obviously, we are still guided by the national position on this and uh, we await further guidance from um, from the powers that be. But from my perspective, I think I've had about four people, so it's been raised by four individuals so far. Okay, thanks, Geoffrey. Thanks, Frank. And any other comments to Geoffrey? I think Joe Biden talked about his first 100 days being a 
100 days of impact. Jeffrey, since you've joined us, you've having a really positive impact and the momentum on OD and HR has really picked up since you've joined us. So thank you very much for your hard work. Colleagues, happy to move on to finance. So Jonathan, as we said, thank you very much for standing in for Howard. Uh, what particular points would you care to pull out? Thank you. Can I just check? You can hear me first because my internet just seems to have dropped at the vital moment. Can you yeah, hear me? Jonathan, Very you're absolutely fine. We can see you and okay. hear you. That's great. That's that's good news. So I'll take the report as read and um, just bring some highlights and um, points out from it, if I may. Um, there have been no significant changes in either financial direction or trend over the period of the last month. And at the end of February, the surplus of income above expenditure was cumulatively 3.3 million. And the forecast outturn for the end of the financial year was at the end of February forecast to be circa 3 million. As reported to the last board, we are required to account for unused annual leave at the 31st of March. And owing to the circumstances of the financial year, this of course is going to be quite material. This couldn't be finally determined until the 31st of March, but was valued and accrued for in our year-to-date position and our outturn at 1.4 million at February. And then that will be reconfirmed um, as we account for the end of the financial year. Um, the Trust has incurred additional marginal costs related to the pandemic of 9.9 .9 million year-to-date and has spent 4 million to date against the specific specific allocation made through the STP of 5.7 million for the second half of the year. Then going on to capital, uh, the position of receiving confirmation of capital funding relatively late in the year was highlighted, I know, at the last board. And we're at the final stages now of ensuring a significant proportion of the 12.2 million allocated for March expenditure will be accounted for in this current financial year. Cash and working capital management remains good and free from any significant issues in month. So they were the highlights that I'd like to bring out to the report and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Any questions to Jonathan on the finances? Well, that's the result, Jonathan. Um, standing in for Howard, no questions, job done. And uh, presenting a set of results which are most the best we've ever produced. So uh, long may that continue. Thank you very much, Jonathan. The colleagues therefore happy to move on? OK, thank you. We've got a couple of items for approval. The first is the standing orders and standing financial instructions. Erica? Yes, Chair, the, uh, the standing orders have been updated to that since published in 2017. They have been through TMB and the Audit Committee, and indeed the Audit Committee had, have had a workshop to uh, go through them in more detail. Um, I think the, the, the general points to reinforce is the, um, the requirements of the standing orders haven't really changed. It is, it is one of formatting and allowing them to be more accessible. Uh, and we have reinforced um, the, some of the procurement rules within the standing orders and the financial um, standing financial instructions have been updated to reflect the, the current organisation. Thank you, Erica. Uh, Andrew, as Chair of Audit, anything you'd like to add? Uh, um. No, I don't think so. We, as Erica said, we had the opportunity to, to see them in an audit committee and we had a, a session yesterday to review them. So, yeah, we, we were happy to, we weren't approving them, but to, to present them, to have them presented to the board. OK, thank you, Andrew. Um, questions and perspectives, Richard? Yeah, um, Erica, do you think that um, standing orders need to at least acknowledge that we're part of the foundation group and in particular the role of the uh, strategy committee and the sec second comment was that I guess we will have to re review all of these standing orders when we're clearer about the um, implications of, I of the ICS arrangements that we talked about in the workshop. Erica? 
I can I can certainly add something that um, to explain the, the foundation group. Um, and that probably came out in the workshop yesterday, didn't it, Andrew, with the discussion about the um, the chief executive and the managing director roles and uh, yes. how they're drawn out within the standing orders. Okay, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Erica. And any other questions or perspectives? Andrew, back up. Yeah, I was just going to confirm what Erica said. We um, that was a particular issue we raised, and it's um, it's 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 clear, but it does it does represent um, an unusual arrangement. I, I'd suggest um, having a chief exec and a and a, a managing director. Um, but we we were content that the way it was expressed represented the way we work. Um, I think the other thing, Erica. Um, as we talked about this being more of a evolutionary approach, uh, so from time to time you may well bring changes um, in the system. Um, Thank you, Andrew. Um, can I ask colleagues to be on mute? We can hear some of you typing. Um, so um, the pearls of wisdom coming out of those keyboards. Um, so our colleagues happy to accept uh, with our minor adjustment, the standing orders and standing financial instructions. Please raise a digital hand if you're not happy to accept. Andrew, your digital hand is up. Is that a legacy hand? OK, super approved. Thank you very much. Then we've got the Foundation Group Strategy Subcommittee Terms of Reference. Um, Richard, we'll take these as read unless there's any particular points you wanted to pull out. OK, there is a prison chair. It's simply an uh, annual exercise we go through of reviewing the terms of reference. And there's, there's one or two changes there in track changes, but um, there's nothing, nothing, nothing major to report. OK, thank you, Andrew. So any questions or perspectives? Uh, if you're not happy to approve, please raise a digital hand. OK, Julie approved. Thank you. We then for on to the items for noting and information. The first is the digital programme update report. Um, Jonathan, which will again to help you take as read, but is there anything you particularly wanted to pull out? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think it's probably best if we do take this as read. I don't think I'm probably the best person to try and summarise the digital strategy on behalf of Howard. Um, that's okay, yeah, Jonathan. That's okay. Thank you. Um, so, any questions on the digital program update report? Chairman, could I just say um, Simon Lind joined the call. I, if I could try and answer any questions, if there are any, I am the understudies understudy, but uh, I, I'm very happy to, if I can to pick up any queries on the digital strategy and Howard's absence. Simon, you underplay your influence. I know. <laughs> so, thank you very much for your hard work. Um, so, questions and perspectives. You've got Lucy first, please. So it's not a question, but I think it, it, it would be prudent just to um, raise the issue that we have identified a problem with the electronic observations element of EPR, so the nurse EOPS. Uh, and as a consequence of that, a number of uh, individuals from the EPR team and from the senior nursing team uh, are exploring those issues and pulling together a briefing paper to bring back to Clinical Audit and Effectiveness Committee later this month, um, just to, to um, unearth the issues really and then look at how we resolve those. Thank you. Thank you Lucy. Um, clearly important for us to resolve them. Um, and any other questions or perspectives? So apart from the um, uh, issue that Lucy's just raised, are you happy Simon overall with progress? Yes, I think so. Um, I've just responding to Lucy's queries, there's, there's two particular issues, uh, one of which we believe is fixed and will be uh, deployed to the production environment on Tuesday, so Tuesday the 6th. It's actually ready to go just now, but it's not good practice to make an amendment just before a long weekend. Um, so we've agreed with Kath Davis to hold off on that amendment and that will be put in on Tuesday and, and we'll continue to work on the other issues. In, in the broader rollout of nurse noting, um, we've finished our award today and that's continuing and we'll be on lug ward starting on Tuesday after the bank holiday. So nurse noting is continuing to roll out and we're making good progress across the rest of the other um, elements of EPR. Thank you, Simon. And Jane? Yeah, it was just going to be a question on nurse um, noting, uh, Simon, because there mm. were 
a number of things that would improve it because it's it's yeah, clunky. Sure. Have we got a have we got a time scale for when those improvements are going to come in? There's some that we've made already. Um, we met, um, I think it was the 26th of January after after the session with yourself and Lucy, which was at Christmas time, wasn't it? Um, we met as a as a team along with nursing colleagues. Uh, Kath Davis helped us uh, with that meeting, and and the things that we could change immediately have been changed already, and those those are ongoing. And any feedback we get from wards are, you know, there's a continual churn now of those improvements going into the product. The the, the main there's there will be a software update which we'll get during the summer. Uh, which will bring the smart forms in, which will enable us then to pull data through more uh, readily, if you like, from other forms uh, to pre-populate, uh, which will get rid of some of that duplication, which has been a frustration, and that and that's scheduled um, in a release during the summer months. So any of the changes that we've been able to make as we've been going along, we've done or continue to do, and those that require a software software update, we've specced that with Maxims, and we should get that during the summer. Super. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Jane. Any other questions or perspectives? Simon, thank you for your hard no, work. Thank you, Simon. Thank all, all of the team and look forward to the next update. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Um, we therefore move on to the staff survey. Uh, really some positive things to pull out here, Geoffrey. Um, over to you. Well, uh, thanks, Russell. I did a presentation slide, so I'm not sure if you want me to go through the presentation or just to talk through the slides, through the uh, through the paper. So, um, Jeff, if you've gone to the effort of pulling out some slides, why don't you share them and just pull out the key points? Oh, absolutely. I I'll do that. So I'll try and share my slide and hopefully I will do it properly this time around. OK, just bear with me. Because I've been practicing. <laughs> We've got a new education director, haven't we? That's <laughs> can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, well, thanks, though. I mean, certainly we all know that the staff survey is very useful for the NHS because it gives you a temperature check of how things are within the within the trust. And we know that happy staff equates to happy patients. So it's very important that we take this seriously. And we do at Wire Valley. So if I just go through my slides very quickly. The slide just gives you an overview just to show that we had a comprehensive coverage within the trust so all the different staff groups were involved in this and we had a response rate of 44 percent which is uh, a reasonable response rate considering the median is 40 45 percent. So the key highlights of the survey is the fact that since 2017 we've seen some significant improvements in terms of the key areas within the survey. So when you think about what staff are saying about patient care, how they recommend the, the trust, and also the fact that they feel heard, they feel as though what they say matters. So their view counts within, within Y Valley. And on the 10 key areas within the survey, you know, we're doing above average in six areas, average in three areas, and there's one area which is not just a Y Valley problem, it's an NHS wide problem in terms of bullying and harassment. And I'll come back to this because we've certainly taken some concerted actions to address this, but there's still more work for us to do in terms of that um, the theme within the survey. So overview of the results, as I mentioned already, this just tells you that we're making steady progress. And also considering the impact of COVID, it was very pleasing to see that our staff still feel that on the 10 key areas from EDI all the way through the team working, we are above average. I already talked about bullying and harassment and I'll come back to that, but overall very good picture for, for Wire Valley. Looking back as well, you know, in terms of if you look at 2019 and 2020, this slide just shows that on all the 10 key areas, there hasn't been any significant deterioration. And I think that's important though, Bearing in mind we had COVID last year, so the fact that our staff is still saying on all those 10 key areas, they feel as though we are doing okay, I think that's something to be proud of. Um, quality of care, I mean certainly this is an area that we know we can do more on and not just for Y Valley but across the health service. So when you look at this slide, it tells you that in terms of quality of care, for 2020 we are rated as average. So that is an area that we certainly want to do more work on. The next slide is still on quality of care because this is a quite an important metrics in terms of the staff survey. 
and we look at those three questions on the, I think it's reassuring in a way to see that with the investments that we put it into play, all the amount of work we're doing on quality, patient safety, trying to enhance the patient experience. I am convinced that over the next few years or so, we could start seeing our ratings go above above average. So still a lot of work to be done, but, but certainly from the investments that we're making, I believe we head in the right direction. And that's the feedback I'm getting from staff and also our trade union colleagues as well. Um, in terms of staff engagement, I mean, this is not by accident or by default. This is absolutely by design. When you look at these three uh, questions within the slide, you can see that since 2016, due to the concerted efforts of the chief exec, the MD, and also the entire senior team, engagement is really rising. So we are on an upward traje trajectory, which I think is a good thing, because certainly if you engage your staff in a healthcare environment, you can then enhance the service that you offer to patients. And feedback is pretty good since uh, 2016. EDI, health and well-being, very important uh, metrics as well. So you can see from this uh, slide that we are also making good progress and the groups we have in place are having a positive impact. Uh, in terms of flexible working and immediate line managers, certainly the um, introduction of leadership development programs and also a variety of HR policies and practices are also having an impact. Still some more work to be done in terms of the flexible working practices, but overall, I think we're doing okay in terms of this uh, measures as well. Um, in terms of violence and the safety culture, I mean, over the last few uh, years though, we've actually invested a lot of time and effort in this. We've done work with the police in terms of the Operation Nightingale, and we've enhanced the working practices and systems across the, uh, the, the the trust. So you can also see that there's certainly been a reduction in terms of the violence being reported, but it's still an area that we keep a focus on because we know that we cannot rest on our laurels. We still need to carry on the uh, amount of good work that we've been doing over the last few years. Bullying and harassment, this is what I mentioned previously. This is the only area where we're slightly below the, the average. But having said that, I don't think it's a bad thing because since the meat staff's uh, inquiry with Sir Francis Laird, it's very clear that organizations need to encourage people to open up and to report any bad practices within the trust. So for me, though, the fact that our staff are coming forward and raising concerns through the Freedom to Speak of Guardian route or through the HR route, I think it's a good thing. But having said that, we also understand that we need to do more work on this because we have a zero tolerance approach of any bullying and harassment. So over the next few months, though, we're going to be doing more campaigns, more awareness sessions, and we're going to be training people up and trying to help departments where we think may have a potential problem in there. So more work to be done in terms of bullying and harassment. So key developments, this slide just shows that overall, though, you know, we've put a lot of good things in place over the last four or five years. And certainly things like the leadership charter and the staff compact demonstrate the commitment for us to ensure that we look after our people. And not just the staff survey results, but the more regular NHS people poll surveys, which we now do on a monthly basis, are also giving us an indication that we are on the right track in terms of the investments and the support processes that we have in place for our staff. So my final slide is just about so key actions then for 2021-22. So obviously we've got a comprehensive action plan in place that myself and Jane Ives and my senior colleagues were driving uh, across the, the trust. Locally, we also have local action plans as well because some of the actions required would be for local uh, departments and line managers to take forward. But we are overseeing that and making sure that we're looking at health and well-being, the safety culture, and also certainly the whole leadership and management development programs that we need to put in place or that we are implementing to try and support the, the trust. So all in all, my view would be that the results are pretty good results. We know we can always do more, but certainly 
the overall picture is very positive over the last five years. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of the key messages from the staff survey and i um, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jeffrey. Really very clear. Um, and thank you for your summary. Any questions or perspectives from colleagues? Chris? Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a remarkable set of results and, and, and many congratulations um, to all involved in getting to this point. Um, I, th these were not negative, but questions 17B uh, and 18B on slide um, 11 of 14 about uh, people feeling secure, raising concerns about unsafe clinical practice and then acting upon how confident were they that people would act upon those concerns. We're plateauing and I just wondered whether any thought had been given to why that might be and what else we could do as an organisation to to um, improve the, those scores really. Jeffrey, do you want David to answer that or you have <laughs> I think David would do a better job. <laughs> David. Um, yeah, I, I can't think what else we could do, Chris, to, to champion that, um, that that ethos that we're trying to, to, to get through the organisation. Um, perhaps it's just one of um, sort of penetration, but I'm, 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 perhaps we haven't got to every area uh, with our new way of working and, and wanting to be open to to really dealing seriously with uh, with things, but um, I can't. I'm open to suggestions. Thank you, David. Um, can I, can I come there, Russell? Because I think I think I mean David uh, has has done a lot. Everyone on this call has done a lot. And I think probably this is one of those things where it just needs to you know some of the changes that we've implemented in the last year in some of the specialties we've discussed at board probably will reflect in, in the next set of results because if you think about it we've, we've, we've done some things over the course of the year that all staff probably are now more aware of. Thanks. I think one of the other things Glenn and you're well aware of this is it's the responsibility of those in leadership roles throughout the organisation to recognise the impact of their leadership style and behaviours on others and to self-reflect and if there's one thing that comes out of that question in my view the plattering it's a need for senior people to reflect on the impact of their behaviours. Jane? Yes, thank you. There's a, a, a similar point. I think some of it is is just keeping going and being consistent and give those same messages consistently over and over and again. There are two uh, uh, areas I wanted to talk about a little bit. The first was around um, you know, our staff perception that quality of care has reduced this year over last year. And, you know, I, I, we've been through a pandemic. Uh, and there's no doubt that, you know, we, in some ways we haven't been able to provide, you know, sort of we've got so many more people waiting for so much longer. You know, that isn't where, where we want to be. So I, I'm I'm not surprised. And in a way, it's good that our staff are are, are saying that and picking it up. And the, and the second one was around the point on bullying. Uh, because actually it's, it's really just that one area where it's uh, got significantly worse, which is around bullying from uh, from colleagues. And, and, and there, there are two possible um, explanations to that. One is behaviour's got worse. Um, and the second is that um, we've promoted freedom to speak up and we've been very clear around um, uh, about what staff can expect um, and the behaviour that they can expect. And I tend to think it's probably the second one that more staff are raising that this um, that behaviour is unacceptable um, and that's a really good thing. So I think it will get worse before it gets better and I, I think that's my personal take but we'll, we'll we'll see what happens over the next year or two and hopefully it really starts to go the other way. Great and it's really important for members of staff who may be watching this, we encourage you to speak up about unacceptable behaviour, unacceptable bullying, unacceptable um, behaviour in others. Please do speak up. The board want to hear about your concerns. Andrew? Yeah, I had a question which was answered by Jane um, and a comment which is basically I like the term um, Jeffrey used absolutely by design and I think if you look at this, at the, the, what the content of the board and particularly the exec's agendas over the past four years, um, this is absolutely by design. It just shows that you can make a difference. It's very good. No, absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. And Lucy? I think I just wanted to um, go back to the about Chris's question really about this 
plateauing of, of people feeling sec secure to raise concerns about unsafe clinical practice. And I think I think you, uh, Jade's absolutely right about consistent behaviours. But I think um, in the past, perhaps staff have um, viewed serious incident reporting and therefore the declaration of a serious incident as a, as a negative thing. But I think what will help is actually we've had three serious incidents recently where that round table get together to extrapolate the learning um, they found really, really positive and lots of teams were involved in that. So if teams see that as a positive experience and, and what it's designed to do, which is to make practice safe, then their word out on the street will help help staff to continue to feel secure in, in raising concerns, I think. Thank you, Lucy. And uh, finally, David, I think. Um, yeah, that now that Chris has focused my mind a, a little bit, um, I'd, I'd maybe draw attention to the gradient of improvement over the last three years, um, which is better than the last year. But certainly we started off at a very low base, I think, Chris, but I had to say that, didn't I? <laughs> I think like us as individuals, all organisations are on a journey. The issue is where do we want to end up and the um, where we want to end up and why is to be an exemplar anchor organisation within our communities, which leads by example in terms of values and behaviours to deliver the best possible care. And I think that, as Andrew said, the results, the staff survey results are the output of a series of inputs from the leadership team over the last few years. So I think that they're to be applauded, to be recognised, but not for us to be satisfied with them because we've still got a long way to go. When only 70%, although it's a big improvement, of our staff would recommend us as a place for care for a loved one, uh, we've still got a way to go to deliver the outcomes that uh, we would all want for those who use our services. Geoffrey, thank you for the introduction. Great to see you're now a technical guru when it comes to sharing your slides. Um, colleagues, happy to move on? OK, thank you. So we're then on to the infection prevention and control bath. Um, Lucy? Yeah, just very briefly. Um, so board received the first version of the back bath, sorry, back in the summer of last year. And then that was followed up with a um, transition monitoring call with the CQC, where they reported that they were satisfied with our self-assessment of, of that bath at that time. Um, and just to refresh people's memories, there were some domains or some key lines of inquiry when we reported to board that we were either partially or non-compliant with. And since July, we achieved full compliance in all key lines of inquiry for the BAF. And then in February this year, the BAF was updated nationally um, and they either reassessed or reconfigured some of the existing key lines of inquiry and indeed added some new ones, which meant we needed to further assess our compliance against for 56 standards. We approached it in exactly the same way as we did last time, which is to pull a multidisciplinary team together, including obviously the consultant microbiologist, the lead infection prevention nurse, myself as the DIPSI, uh, a compliance officer and um, senior nursing leads from the divisions to assess our compliance. We have self-assessed that we're compliant with 52 out of the 56 standards and are only partially compliant with four. Um, but none of those present a risk to us in terms of partial compliance and work is in progress that actually within the next um, month we'll be fully compliant with those uh, four outstanding standards. Um, the, the 56 standards are attached in an appendix. They, it is an, an abridged version of the BAF because I remember comments from board last time. It's a bit of a monster of a document to understand so that the, the version attached in the papers is an abridged version. The full version is available on request, as is all the evidence to support our self-assessment. And the BAF is routinely monitored through the Infection Prevention Com Committee on a, on a regular basis. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lucy. Any questions or perspective on the BAF? OK, thank you very much, Lucy. So we'll then move on to the committee summary reports. The first is the audit committee from the 18th of March. Anything you'd particularly like to pull out, Andrew? Um, yeah, just, just to say that all the items that were brought to the board's attention were positive. 
um, which is pleasing from an audit committee's point of view to be to, to doing that. Um, it was Howard's last meeting, um, so we were able to wish him well. And obviously that was um, the, the positive nature of the meeting was tinged with a bit of sadness there. And it was also good to welcome Katie Osmond. Um, she was in attendance from the new, the new FD. Um, she, she attended the meeting. Thank you, Andrew. Any questions on the audit committee? OK, colleagues, happy to move on. Charity trustee meeting of the 18th of March. Um, Frank, anything you particularly like to pull out? No, the, the report should stand for itself. There's nothing particular to report. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Any questions or perspectives to Frank on the charity trustee meeting? Thank you, Frank. And then we've got the Quality Committee of the 25th of February. Chris, anything you particularly like to pull out? No, thank you, Chair. Just to note that uh, we are uh, have been running at a, a reduced level, uh, but there are some uh, benefits that we'll continue uh, going forward. Uh, but we might do that for one more month uh, just to allow the organisation to settle back in before we uh, bring more members back into that meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Chris. Any questions to Chris on uh, that meeting? Thank you. So we therefore move on to some old uh, audit committee um, minutes. Uh, the first is the 10th of December. Um, anything to add to that, Andrew? Uh, nothing to add. Any questions from colleagues? Thank you. The trust charity trustee meeting of the 10th of December. Anything to add, um, Frank? No, thank you. Um, thank you. Then the Quality Committee of the 28th of January. Anything for you, Chris? No, thank you, Chair. Any questions from colleagues? Okie dokie. We then move on to questions from members of the public. Um, uh, Erica, I think we've had two. Would you care to read them out, please, and the replies? Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, the first question um, asks, uh, please can the board clarify what recourse patients and the public have if their complaint to the hospital has not been addressed within the 30 working day period set out on the Y Valley Trust Complaints website? Um, I have replied to both of these uh, questions, Chair, and, and uh, the recipient is happy with the answers, but for clarity, uh, I've, uh, the answer to the first question is if we can uh, if we can can find a resolution to any concerns or complaints that you might have, we'll do everything we can. However, there may be occasions where we can do no more. In these circumstances, we will tell you, and you will then be free to ask the health service ombudsman to review your complaint. And the ombudsman's details are uh, provided, and have been provided. The second question relates to. Please can the board clarify what processes it has in place to verify the existence of a restraining order that restricts friends and family from contacting a, van, uh, a vulnerable patient. Um, in this case, our safeguarding team uh, under Lucy would be involved and um, all correspondence would be through a power of attorney or through uh, the patient's uh, lawyers. Um, and uh, if there were a restraining order in place. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, any other business colleagues, please raise a digital hand if you've got any other business. Thank you very much. Our next meeting is on the 6th of uh, May. Um, we will be, certainly for the foreseeable future, still be meeting digitally. Um, we understand that uh, some members of the public are disappointed that we weren't able to live stream at today's meeting, so we will look into that for the future. Um, we've shifted over to a different format called Microsoft Teams rather than the Zoom format, but if we can live stream, we will. Um, in the meantime, thank you very much. Um, my suggestion to the board is we have a 15 minute um, gap and then we get going again at 20 past two. Thank you very much. <laughs>